Hello miteinander, I'm Geshady6, and this is a new Toho themed let's play. We are playing The Tempest of Heaven and Earth, Lionheart's most recent game at the time of this video. Now that developer, Lionheart, specializes in action games and has gained quite a renown for them. This one in particular has had me hooked even with its earliest demo versions. So much that I vowed on my very life to LP it once it came out. Unless it turned out to be horrendously botched, but that was not the case. As expected, it turned out great, in my opinion at least, which is why you're seeing it right now. Now this game may be mostly about fierce ass kickings, but it does have a fairly ambitious story to it. At this moment it is unfortunately still untranslated, which could cause a problem, but I've informed myself of the rough happenings beyond what you just see the characters do, so I don't think we're gonna feel that lost. The character on the right here, Iku Nagai, is under the suspicion by Celestials to be causing earthquakes on the surface of Gensokyo. Our main protagonist, Tenshi Hinanai, interrogates her about this, but as if she's not herself, Iku does not share any of her knowledge with us. To our great dismay, she is even backed up by the demon of boundaries, Yukari Yakumo, who tells us flat out that we should butt out of her and Iku's business. Of course, Tenchi will not comply to these rude demands, especially because she hates Yukari's guts. Because of her interference, Iku is able to get away from us. Such impudence, we're gonna give her a good whooping for that. Or are we? No, we bit off a little bit more than we could chew here. Because of Yukari's dirty trickery, we are banished down to the world beneath paradise. And that is where our quest begins. A quest for answers. A quest for vengeance. A quest about bashing completely unrelated individuals over the head. Tenjo no Tempest, as this quest is originally called. So, we've hit ground near the bamboo forest, and we are experiencing firsthand what the Celestials have been noticing. Earthquakes. What's much more terrifying for Tenchi is to find out that she has lost her natural ability to fly. This must be the first Toho fan game that explains why characters don't just fly everywhere. Quite commendable. Anyway, this is the point where we are finally given control. Let us start with the controls, because this game is pretty complex. You have so many tools at your disposal. You have of course a jump, but also a double jump. Still that's fairly common. What's not so common is that you have a multifunctional attack, one that intelligently adapts to the context. If there are enemies in your vicinity, you will start a melee combo with it, but if there are none, you will shoot a beam instead. All of that with the same button. Apart from that, there is also another button for a fixed melee attack, the one that you just saw where Tenchi used her Sword of Hisoten. It may seem a bit redundant to have a secondary melee attack, but there is a good idea behind this. We'll get to that later. Now about those beams that I mentioned earlier, there are actually a lot of different types of them in this game, and you equip them to one of your four style slots. Switching styles also has its own button. Just then, you saw a little symbol popping up over Tenshi's head. That means we switched styles. We are now using the non-conceptual arrow, a very basic shot that can be fired at an angle if you need to. Oh, now this cutscene. This introduces a new gameplay mechanic, actually the most defining one in the game I'd say. Activation and weather effects. You see, we have another button, one that enables us to dodge and dash. If you can dodge or dash through an enemy's attack, you will mark them visibly. If you can then hit them quickly with the Sword of Hisoten, you will create a weather effect. And hey, here's our super. Can't have a Lionheart game without an awesome super. Supers, well, they make you kill stuff, obviously. Let's spare the details for now and go back to the weather effects. They are always temporary and during their duration they will give you certain bonuses. Most of those bonuses are passives, for example boosting your attack power or making you take less damage in return, but some of them are also more tangible. They will help you in overcoming some obstacles, kind of like solving minor puzzles, nothing I would call brain twisting. And here's our second super, 
Earth Sign, Sword of the Unyielding Soil. If you have a thing for fancy names, I sure do. That one and Weather, Scarlet Weather Persuasion are the only supers we have so far, but there are a lot more in this game. We will get some really amazing ones later. Look forward to it. But for now, let's appreciate what we have and persuade this lot here. Huh, seems like it persuaded them to die. Of course, you can't just use supers willy-nilly. They use up a lot of feral energies. Feral energies are the red gas clouds that we're constantly setting free and collecting. Our stock is shown on the very bottom of the screen, with a number telling us how many spare units we have, and a bar behind it telling us how full our cord unit is. The supers that we have are the cheapest ones in the game, but still cost a full 3 units. Beams also cost feral energy, but on a much smaller scale. Now did you just see that? Our enemies try to catch us in a cage. <laughs> Futile against the mighty Tenchi. Now about her. In case you don't know your Tohos, Tenchi Inanai was the final boss of Toho 10.5, Scarlet Weather Rhapsody. She may look tender and enigmatic, but she is not a good role model. The best way to describe her would be the Lindsay Lohan of Gensokyo. Yeah. It's fitting because she does have a criminal record. She has leveled the Hakode Shrine and was then forced to rebuild it. Now there must be some desperate reason for her evil deeds, right? No, she was just bored. So yes, that is our heroine. Perhaps she's not the one Gensokyo needs, but she's the one it deserves. In the third section of the first level, the fighting gets a little bit rougher, as the game introduces my second favorite enemy of it, the Inaba Rabbits. I really like their attitude. When they hit you with their mallet, they pull down their eyelid and stick out their tongue. This may seem a little bit weird, but I just can't be mad at them. They run around with their outstretched arms, and they even dance around when they should be idle. They've got so much personality. They're just adorable and great. The Inabas move around quickly, but they don't have a lot of health, so in the end, they're not much of a problem. I feel pretty bad slicing them up and mauling them, but it has to be done. If you're wondering who my favorite enemy above them is, well, you're gonna have to wait a few more episodes for them to appear. But it'll be worth it, trust me. So, we are getting very close to the end of the level, but we shouldn't be too hasty in leaving. There's another secret just below us. We can spot it if we just scroll down the screen. There is another fault line. We've been seeing a few of those. They are a great source of feral energies. The fault lines are basically where the earth cracked open from too much pressure. It's where the scarlet clouds are overflowing. And yes, they're very important for the story. As we're going to find out just about here. This is the spot where we meet Reisen Udongi in Inaba, who has been burying a special medicine at the fault lines in order to depressurize them and fight the earthquakes that way. Very noble of her. Unfortunately, Tenchi doesn't get along well with noble people, and Reisen still remembers her hijinks from Toho 10.5 and suspects her as the mastermind again. I bet Tenchi didn't even claim her innocence. Why should she care what this do-gooder thinks of her? To nobody's surprise, Rayson becomes our first level boss. She is very easy as expected, so this is a good chance to go over how bosses work in this game. The system that's used here is very close to the one from Toho 12.3, in that apart from the normal health bar, bosses also have a separate amulet bar. If you can deplete that, the boss will become completely defenseless, and that is when you can deliver the main bulk of the damage. What you're probably wondering now is, where's the trick in that system? Well, causing a weather effect on a boss leads to the Aurora weather, that massively increases your dealt amulet damage. So, what this basically boils down to is through careful dodging and countering, you will be able to force an amulet break quicker, and you will defeat a boss much faster than you would with mindless hacking and slashing. Well, so far it looks like we're doing fine. Raisin is already down to her third pattern. Uh, the number of patterns a boss has is symbolized above their health bar, in the form of these little stars. Raisin has five stars in total. The patterns that we've seen until now have been too impressive, have they? 
but the following ones will really demonstrate her themes of hypnosis and illusion. I mean, take a look at all of these raisins. I know what they say about rabbits multiplying, but come on, this is ridiculous. Shame on you, raisin. The greatest danger here doesn't come from the mirror images or what I hope are clones, but rather the giant laser. On the bright side, to get an activation on Raisin, you don't have to dodge through the laser, you just have to dodge anywhere when the laser is on screen. That really makes things a lot easier for you. Really, it's more bark than bite. Okay, on to the final spell card then. The thing is, all bosses except one have two final spell cards. Depending on whether or not certain conditions have been met, you will qualify for one of them. I think that's pretty nifty actually, you're not always sure what you're about to get. The one we need to deal with now is the one where Raisin turns invisible. Don't be fooled by the one that you see in the background, the one that's shooting you. That is just a decoy and not your target. This spell card is not hard at all in my opinion, but it may be a bit confusing for new players. When you get an activation from any attack here, you will reveal a shimmering trace. That's where the true Raisin is. Once you finally cause a weather effect, you will see her in full. Now something that can really help you out here is the homing shot. Not for its damage, but because it will find a partially invisible Raisin by itself. And there we go, victory is ours. So, now Raisin is sitting on her butt. Understandable, it's still sore from our giant ass kicking. Finally, we resolve the misunderstanding by telling her that we are not the mastermind behind this. In fact, now that she knows we're on the same side, she'll help us out. Not personally though, instead she'll give us a sidekick, one that is supposed to give us good luck, Tei Inaba. Something tells me that Tei will keep most of that good luck to herself, but nonetheless, we have a guide now. One that will bring us closer to the source of the earthquakes. And with that, stage 1 is completed, we are shown a stat screen with rankings. All in all, I think we did pretty well. I'm Gesh86, this was the first episode of Tenjo no Tempest, and next time, a wacky fanatic. Bis bald!